to have with us and thank you for doing this year after year. Thank you. I want to welcome everybody into this space and it's a space just like our space at the Bayit. I can imagine us all sitting together at the Bayit gathering, saying hello to each other, these same conversations, saying hi, settling in, finding our spots and waiting for the evening to start. So thank you to everybody. It's such an important evening and we are so um, gratified that you are joining us on this Zoom program as you would have in person. I'm going to open this with words of introduction about Kristallnacht, and then I will light a memorial candle and then say the El Mele Rachamim, the memorial prayer that we say for victims of the Shoah. And then um, Rabbi Ezra will introduce Joan and we'll have the main part of our program this evening. And again, thank you, John Yael is showing the book. So we'll have an opportunity to do that later and maybe we can spotlight it later. Thank so you. for those, yeah, so for those who haven't, please just for the next few minutes, if you can mute yourselves and, um, and listen as we, as we introduce this important topic. November 9th, 1938, Kristallnacht, the night of the broken glass. 82 years have passed, but the sudden and brutal violence of Kristallnacht must always be remembered. On that night, Nazi stormtroopers and civilians swept through Germany, Austria, and the Sudetenland. These mobs initiated violent pogroms and descended upon the cities, burning synagogues, attacking and destroying Jewish-owned businesses, hospitals, and community buildings. They broke into homes, looted and smashed furniture, <clears throat> and terrorized the occupants. By the end of the night, 7,000 Jewish businesses had been damaged or destroyed. Over 250 synagogues had been demolished, and 30,000 Jewish men were arrested and sent to concentration camps. Historians estimate that hundreds of Jewish men died as direct victims of the violence due to injuries suffered during their incarceration or due to suicide after arrest. On Kristallnacht, the creeping persecution that started with the Nuremberg laws burst into overt and bloody violence. It is often referred to as the start of the Shoah. Arnold Friedman, professor emeritus at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, was a young boy at the time. He recalls the frantic phone calls and conversations between family members and neighbors. His own uncle was thrown down the stairs in his home and then stamped on with heavy boots until he died, right in front of his little boy, Arnold's cousin. Ruth Winkleman was, was 10 years old and recalls vividly how frightened and shaken she was seeing the destruction and the violence the following morning. Shop windows were broken everywhere and the words Jew or Jewish pig were written in many places. Smoke rose out of the synagogue from the burning Torah scrolls. Everyone stayed inside fearful of the stormtroopers knocking on their doors and taking away fathers and young men. The sudden violence of Kristallnacht is seared into Ruth's memory forever. Yom HaShoah is a global day, marking our sadness and grief over the Shoah. Yet Kristallnacht is an important day in its own right. It marks the beginning of the destruction in many ways. At the Bayit, we use it as an opportunity to explore different aspects of Holocaust and pre-Holocaust life through speakers, films, and personal connections. As time passes and the number of survivors dwindle, it is crucial to tell and retell these stories so that future generations will know what happened on Kristallnacht and throughout the Shoah.
אל מלא רחמים שוכן במרומים, המצא מנוחה נכונה, תחת כנפי השכינה, במעלות קדושים וטהורים, כזוהר הרקיע מזהירים, לכל נשמות ששת מיליוני היהודים, חללי השואה באירופה, שנהרגו, שנשחטו, שנשרפו ושנספו על קידוש השם בידי המרצחים הגרמנים ועוזריהם משאר העמים. בעבור שהקהל נותן צדקה בעד השכרת נשמותיהם, בגן עדן תהיה מנוחתם, לכן בעל הרחמים יסתירם בסתר כנפיו לעולמים, ויצרור בצרור החיים את נשמותיהם, אדוני הוא נחלתם, וינוחו בשלום על משכבותם, ויעמדו לגורלם לקץ הימין, ונאמר אמן. Good evening, everyone. It's my, uh, sorry, I'm getting a little bit, okay. It's my honor to introduce Joan Long Solomon, who uh, not only is an incredible researcher and writer and documentarian about the Holocaust, uh, who has dedicated years of her life as a writer and activist around Holocaust memory, but is also just since she began joining our synagogue four years ago on Kristallnacht, in fact, um, has become an incredible cornerstone of community in our synagogue. Throughout the pandemic, you've seen her face every Friday night. And she ran a knitting club in our shul for a number of years, bringing together women of cross generations to sit together and share space together. And, um, Rabbi Brecha told us about Kristallnacht, but for me, I just feel so lucky to be able to tell you about Joan, that she's a wonderful friend and a wonderful thinker and someone who is passionate about her place in this world and the bringing up of beautiful memory and beautiful things into our community. So I'm so grateful for you, Joan, being here tonight and for you sharing even just a little bit of of your work, which I know is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll be posting a link to Joan's book, which she published uh, in the chat. Oh, sorry. And um, folks should also feel free to type in questions during the chat and we'll try to address them at the end. But I don't want to take up any more time. So without further ado, Joan Solomon. Thank you so much, Rav Ezra. You're overly kind in um, your words about me and about my work. I'm just so grateful to have found the Bayit um, and to have found a spiritual home here and so many wonderful friends and people. So um, somebody was asking, this is, this is the book, Revival, Remembering the Forgotten Jews of Minds. Not a, not a big book, doesn't take very long to read. And um, so we will start with what I came here to say. Uh, the book is dedicated to every Jewish person without descendants who was mercilessly murdered during the Holocaust, be it in an extermination camp or savagely shot in the street. They have left not a trace of their existence behind and nobody to remember them. And it is also dedicated to my beloved Oma Yechen and Tanta Ruth, two of the victims from Mainz, stolen from me before I ever had a chance to know them. I would like to read to you 
chapter one of the book, How This All Began. I found the carton holding my grandmother's letters in a dark and dusty closet where I had shoved it years before. I had thoughtlessly buried it there thinking that one day in the distant future, I would take the time and attention required to find out what the letter said. There I sat on the floor in the midst of the mess with guilt and recrimination virtually screaming at me. When are you gonna look inside? When will you have those letters translated? Do you think you have forever? Time is flying. My mother was a Holocaust survivor, having endured seven long years of Nazi persecution in her native Germany, together with her mother and sister. Like so many survivors, my mother never spoke about most of her experiences. I knew she had escaped from Nazi Germany in 1939, after World War II began, and that she fled to New York City. Her mother and sister were left behind. Why? What happened to them? I knew instinctively not to ask such questions. The grief, guilt, and anger my mother carried within was palpable and enveloped and smothered me like a thick, dark cloud which polluted my childhood and my relationship with her. I felt her anger and grief every day and carried my own burden of anger. I had no family. I had no grandparents, aunts, uncles, or cousins. I had no brothers or sisters. I was isolated and alone, jealous of the other kids around me who all had siblings and loving families. Mm -hmm. To this day, I envy friends with rich and full family lives. Finding the carton of letters was like discovering buried treasure. Maybe my mother's silence would finally be broken and the secrets she took to her grave would be revealed to me. The carton contained six letters by my grandmother in Nazi Germany to my mother in New York. They were dated from September 1941 through November 14, 1941. Also in the carton, were transcriptions in my mother's handwriting of messages she had received from my grandmother and aunt who were trapped in war-torn Germany. The messages were passed between them by the Red Cross and were their only means of communication during all of 1942. When I received the translated letters, I read them over and over again each time learning something new. And I began what was to become a four year saga of researching my family history. My grandmother wrote about people I had never heard of, aunts, uncles, and cousins, completely unknown to me. She wrote about a rich and full family life. And once again, I felt cheated. What family? How different my childhood could have been were it not for the Nazis. Much to my disappointment, there was little about the existing political conditions in Germany. My grandmother's last message to my mother contained a statement that she and Ruth would soon travel, a thinly disguised reference to her and my aunt's impending deportations. She could not spell out the reality for fear that the censors would not deliver her message, but it was clearly evident that she knew what was coming. Ruth and I shall travel. 
address for now unknown. If possible, we give news. Do not forget us till we meet again. Goodbye, mother. With a bit more probing, I finally had the answers to my questions. While my family was originally from the village of Essenheim, they were forced by the Nazis to abandon their house and the general store they owned and operated in the village and to move to the nearby city of Mainz. My grandfather died in Mainz in 1935. My grandmother and aunt were deported from Mainz on the 30th of September, 1942 to Treblinka extermination camp where they arrived on the 2nd of October, 1942, and were murdered immediately upon arrival. Now I could understand my mother's pain and guilt, and I too carry immense pain inside. My heart screams every time I think of my beautiful grandmother and my 21-year-old aunt and the horrific, unspeakable suffering they endured. Three days in a cattle car where many died while underway from heat, starvation, and dehydration. The arrival at Treblinka and being beaten by SS guards with clubs as they were driven naked with shaved heads into the gas chambers. How could any human being do such a thing to innocent people? While in the throes of researching my family history, I heard about an artist in Germany who created Stolpersteine, stumbling blocks in English, four inch by four inch brass covered blocks like cobblestones bearing the name, date of birth and fate of Holocaust victims. These tiny memorials are paved into the sidewalk in front of the victim's last freely chosen residence. I had Stolpersteine made for my mother, grandmother, and aunt, and I traveled to Germany to be present when they were installed. Their Stolpersteine are now in the sidewalk in front of Klarerstrasse 29 in Mainz. The entire experience in Germany affected me very deeply. I could not shake the realization that were it not for the carton of letters, I never would have known the fate of my family and there would not be Stolpersteine for them in Mainz right now. It would be as though my family had never existed. How many of the nearly 1500 other Jewish victims who had also lived in Mainz, have been completely forgotten. Forgotten because they had no descendants to honor their memory. Forgotten because not just they, but their children and grandchildren were murdered by the Nazis. I could not bear the knowledge that so many men, women, and children had suffered the most inhuman and incomprehensible fate only to leave not a trace of their existence. I was unable to leave Germany with a peaceful heart, despite the fact that I had secured a permanent memorial for my family. How could I condemn all those other people to eternal obscurity? Surely some of them had known my family. And so I decided to research their lives and sponsor Stolpersteiner for them, just as I had for my own family. I wasn't long into the research when I became convinced that Stolpersteiner were not enough. And so this book was born. During the process of putting this book together, I became intimately connected to each one of these individuals and they 
one at a time, have taken their place in my heart as the aunts, uncles, and siblings I never had. So I would like to just very briefly introduce you to these wonderful people who I researched and found out about and wrote about. Julius Hirschberger was a 61-year-old widower who ran a very successful import-export wine business. He was wealthy and very charitable. Marguerite Kramer and her daughter Ruth lived under the radar. Marguerite was a single mother, but she was divorced and could not really live freely because of the Nazis' um, attitude towards divorced women. The Blattner family, Ludwig, Elsa, and their daughter Hannah also owned a very large and very successful wine wholesale, or wholesale um, business. Um, and they were uh, quite wealthy and successful also. Dr. Walter Natan, his wife Elisabeth, and their children Lotta and Hans were um, another family that I researched. And Dr. Natan was an orthopedic surgeon who was quite well known as someone who worked principally on disabled children. Another doctor, Dr. Alfred Haas, was a well-known neurosurgeon and neurologist. He had one son, Gersten, and his wife. The Feiners were uh, very successful business people. Josef Feiner was um, an accountant for a very large concern in mines and also owned real estate that he rented out. His wife, Amelie, very unusual for those times, had her own business in Mainz. And their daughter, Ruth, was a teenager still in school. And lastly, the Frovines. Siegbert Frovine, his wife, Erna, his daughter, Ellen, and his mother-in-law, Johanna, who came to live with her son-in-law and her daughter after her husband passed away. Siegbert Frovein and two of his brothers operated possibly the only kosher, the kosher food um, wholesale business in Germany. He supplied all of the Jewish communities with kosher food, both in Germany and throughout Europe. And he was extremely successful and extremely wealthy. And so these are the people that I researched. Uh, one thing they all had in common was that they were all successful business people or professional people. Um, and um, a number of them, as you heard, were in the wine business. Not unusual because Mainz was in the heart of the wine country beautiful little city, no skyscrapers, um, a huge plaza, if you will, in, in the middle of town where four days a week markets were held and where most people did buy their food. Um, Germany is still largely a, an agricultural country. And so markets are very common. Mainz was also the home to the oldest Jewish community in Europe. There were Jewish people who settled there in uh, roughly 950. And there was a thriving Jewish community that grew and shrank and grew and shrank from 950 until World War II. There were two synagogues, an Orthodox shul, and a liberal synagogue. Both of them had day schools 
and community houses and very active um, programs. And both of them were destroyed on Kristallnacht. Now to get a little bit more specific about the subject of our commemoration this evening, Kristallnacht, on the 9th of November, 1938, this command was circulated to all the group leaders of the Nazi party, that is the SA, the SS, the Gestapo, and the police. The subject was anti-Jewish demonstrations. All Jewish businesses are to be immediately destroyed by uniform SA men and an SA guard set up in order to ensure that no valuables can be stolen. Of course, this wasn't a beneficent order on their part. They wanted the valuables for themselves, the Nazis. The press is to be invited. Synagogues shall be set on fire immediately. Jewish symbols such as Torahs and menorahs are to be secured and taken away from the building. Only Aryan residences are to be protected by the fire department, but also Jewish residences that are physically attached to the Aryan ones. However, the Jews must move out because Aryans will be moving in shortly. Police must not interfere. All Jews are to be disarmed. Any who resist shall be shot immediately. Signs shall be placed on destroyed Jewish stores, synagogues, and such. Signs will read, death to international Jewry. No mercy for the Jewish people. And signs can also be put on empty walls. And this command was put zealously put into effect and reality all through the night of November 9th. When we come to November 10th, the Nazis, uh, the 10th and the 11th, and possibly the 12th as well, the Nazis rounded up 30,000 Jewish men from all over Germany and uh, shipped them off to concentration camps, not ex extermination camps at this point, just concentration camps, which were bad enough, principally Dachau and Buchenwald. A hundred men from Mainz were taken to Buchenwald and uh, Siegbert Frowein was one of them. So, if you do read the book, his story becomes very interesting and very, very sad. I would like to read to you um, just a very short passage that I put into the book because I found it so perfect, perfectly descriptive. Um, it's by Martin Gilbert, who is a very um, accomplished and honored Holocaust scholar and who wrote a wonderful book about Kristallnacht. Clearly, Kristallnacht marked a turning point in the treatment of the Jews of Germany. Six years of legalized anti-Jewish discrimination, isolating the Jews from their fellow Germans and depriving them of the right of full citizenship were replaced on Kristallnacht by the first manifestations of direct na nationwide physical violence combined with arson, the destruction of property, the theft of property, the impoverishment of a whole community, physical assault, deportation, and mass murder. It was a brutal, hysterical, uninhibited assault on everything Jewish on a far wider scale than hitherto. And yet 
only a prelude to something far larger still. There could no longer be any doubt of the Nazis' intentions towards the Jewish people. And so in closing, I would like to offer this little prayer. The departed who I've written about have entered into the peace of life eternal. They still live on earth in the acts of goodness they performed and in the hearts of those who cherish their memory. Hold their memory close and speak of them to your children and your grandchildren so that never again will we be cast into the darkness of evil, hatred, and barbarianism. Amen. And thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Joan. I was wondering if you're okay with it. I'd love to ask you a few questions. Sure. Uh, you could share with us. So first of all, just um, very grateful for your reading and taking us on a journey, uh, even in the short in the short time that you've shared with us. And for those who um, want to learn more about Joan's work, uh, I'm going to repaste the link in the chat and you can head there to purchase the book. Uh, if anybody needs help uh, financially with getting the book, you can reach out to me privately and we have a few copies on hand that we can share. Uh, no one should feel like they can't get the book. Let's put it that way. Let, and, me, let me just interject if I could for a moment. Yeah, please. Um, the book is priced so that I will not receive any uh, royalties on purpose. I feel that if I were to take any money, it would uh, muddy the memory of these people. So uh, that's all I want to say. I don't, I don't want anybody to think I'm here to <laughs> sell the books or make money. I'm not. I just want people to remember. So um, Joan, I guess I was wondering um, if you could say sort of like maybe one thing that you were surprised by in your research, uh, in your learning or research, what was one thing that, you know, sort of caught you off guard or that you weren't really expecting, expecting to find? I think the numbers um, that is the Jewish community in Mainz before the war started was roughly 3,000. To me, that is a large number for a little city. Mainz is not a big city like Frankfurt. It's, it's a little city. And then at the end of the war, when the American army um, came into the city to liberate, it, there were only 66 Jews left. I think that I, I could never have thought that a whole community really was wiped out. I, that was very shocking to me. Mm -hmm. um, in our, you know, in our, all of our conversations, Joan, you always talk about wanting to get back on the track of researching and learning more. And I know, especially in these last number of months, you know, where we're all so homebound, it's even harder. But I guess I was curious in terms of future projects or other things you'd be excited about, excited about, feel obligated to even, to learn or write about, what are some of the areas that you would uh, be interested in exploring? Well, I, I would like to continue um, having Stolpersteine put in for victims who have no descendants. Um, that's really important to me if we're ever able to travel again because that this work is done in Germany, the, in the archives, in the city archives. Um, and I have a filing cabinet full of files that I've been playing back and forth. Yes, no, should I, shouldn't I um, try to write another book about people who 
managed to escape Germany and survive and come to this country. Um, and found that it was not easy for them to make the transition. Uh, many people were not able to successfully make the transition and were never um, really well adjusted and happy in this country, even though they had escaped the Nazis and they had some of them had gone through hell um, to get visas and to get um, affidavits and to actually come to this country. It was, um, it was not an easy adjustment for anyone, but for some of them was a really um, impossible adjustment to make. And I think that that's something that's important for people to understand. Uh, somebody asked me once, why was your mother so unhappy and why was she uh, so um, not well adjusted? She escaped, she was alive, she should be happy. Um, she lost her mother and her sister. And even had she not, there was anti-Semitism in this country and it was very difficult to get a job and to find a place to live. And so, but I don't know if, I haven't decided yet if I wanna do that book or not. Um. Could you say a word about uh, what it felt like when the Stolpersteins were installed in the locations and were there local folks there and how were they reacting to, to those moments? This is a question from Yael, who's always the most curious and wonderful. There, yes, there were large crowds um, every time Stolpersteine were installed and had this one, two, six, seven families, 20, I think 20 something individuals, but seven families. And there was a separate um, installation and ceremony at each installation. It was, um, it was really unbelievable. So many people, so many local people, they would see a little crowd and they'd come by what's going on and they will know what Stolpersteine are because they're all over the city and they would stay and they would listen. And um, I gave all my speeches in German and um, people would come up to me after and ask questions about the families. if. I hadn't covered it in my talks. It was just, it was, I don't know, indescribable, I, I guess. I, I miss being there and I miss doing the work very, very much. I, I think that doing memorial work is more gratifying and more important than this second book that I'm toying with. So if I could continue, I, I made nine trips to Germany in four years to do research and to install Stolperstein. If I could continue that work, that, that would be my first choice. Thanks, Joan. I had um, two more questions. Are we, we I know that uh, over, maybe I think that was a year and a half ago in the summer, we showed your documentary um, is that something that we can make available to others in the shul? Sure. Uh, especially folks who are on tonight. Sure. And um, I can send a link. Yeah. And you can watch it on your computer. Um, the link has a life of something like 30 days. So I can send people the link and I would love for people to see it. I'm very proud of that documentary. And um, I guess the last the last question, and then I'm going to pass it off to Stephen to to close out, is that I think one of the one of the um, components that I find so inspiring about you and your story is that that you took on this project and this learning at a later point in life, right? It wasn't like all of your de 
degrees as a as a youngster we're geared in this direction but this was a labor of love later so i know there's so many folks on this call of of all ages and generations and what would you say is um a good point of entry or ways for folks who are maybe interested in doing a sliver of this work of whether it's original research or learning or memorializing can you just share another word about sort of how other folks could get involved because i know your story is very personal yes. and um but not everybody has that personal story you mean to get involved in researching Holocaust victims, particularly? Yeah. Um, you can you can write to the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, DC, and ask for copies of deportation lists from any number of cities in Germany. And um, they will be very happy to send you copies of the lists. And you can start there, going through the lists of the names of people and their addresses and where they lived. And the lists are organized by the place of origin and the uh, extermination camp that they wound up in. And then from there, it's just spending a lot of time on the internet um, searching the name sometimes you get a lot of information about a person that you would never expect just by entering their name and searching their name and um, the people at the holocaust museum are also very glad to help you do research and um, there is a jewish genealogical society that you can draw upon and the museum down in Battery Park, the Museum of Jewish Heritage here in New York is um, also a Holocaust museum. And they have um, people there who can help you to do some research. And I'll, I'll be glad to help too. Right. I'll, I'll be more than happy to help anyone. Thank you so much, Joan. I think that's a perfect way to, to close out. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, I'd ask everyone to give a round of applause. Me. I know you can't hear, but if you're on gallery view, you can see uh, just how grateful we are to you. And I'm going to hand it off to Stephen now to close out. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. You're such a treasure to our Bai community and to so many beyond. As we move towards closing, I want first to acknowledge the presence here as we number close to 70 screens, uh, individuals, families, and groups that have joined to listen and remember together. And I wanna acknowledge that on this Zoom gathering, Eva Bender, a survivor, and there may be other survivors who have joined us as well. We treasure you and we're grateful for your continued presence in our lives. And so many scanning the screens who are second generation and third generation, those who have loved ones who experienced Kristallnacht, seeing Leon Metzger and others who have their family's recollections of that terrible night, which was not the beginning but in so many ways serves to mark the beginning of this era of unspeakable horrors, the time of the Shoah. And Joan, listening to you, I was reminded of words that have so impacted me about memory, the teaching of Dr. Ron Wolfson about the word remember that we've shared in various settings. He says this, a member is an individual in a group. Remember means reuniting the family, bringing together again those who are closest to us. He suggests that remembering means in some way reintegrating loved ones who have passed into our lives in the present. 
bringing their static identity into real being with us today. Not just an act of summoning up the past, but imagining it forward into the present. And you've given a gift to those who would not otherwise have had a chance to be remembered by bringing their lives to light, sharing them with us, and giving them a sense of eternity. And we carry forward perhaps an imagined moment in their shop or store around their Shabbat table or walking through the streets of mind, parents holding the hands of children. I also want to acknowledge, of course, that we are here because of and with Toby and Ravavi. They are our teachers of never again and of Shoah memory. And in all the different ways that we try to carry forward that message, preventing future genocides from taking place for all humanity, caring for lifting up and cherishing our survivors and their families, but sacred work alongside that is the work to protect and illuminate and remember the lives of those who would otherwise be forgotten. They're like some of the shards of broken glass that would otherwise have been left on the street or swept away. And we pick them up and we put them into a container. We place them on our mantelpieces and we allow the light to reflect and refract through them. And Joan, your work and your book and your commitment is to bring that light to us. And I pray that like the, lit, the candle that Rabbanit Bracha lit at the beginning, I know that some of us had joined into a different room at the beginning. And I'm glad that we're all together and we're able to hear Joan, your presentation together. But like the, the candle that Rabbanit Bracha lit at the beginning with her introductory words and the introductory memorial prayer, each of their lights burns a little bit brighter because of you and you inspire me and us to hold their memory sacred and to do each in our own way this Kristal Nacht, the work of remembering. And I give you the bracha, Joan, together with Charlie for health and for strength and to continue to inspire on your spiritual journey and your journey of teaching, remembering, and honoring. I want to thank, of course, Rev Ezra and Yael for making this Kristal Nacht possible. Of course, it feels different not to be lighting that candle and reciting the memorial prayer together in shul, but we are as together as we can be. And I'm grateful to each and every one of you who took the time tonight. Kristal Nacht is too often too forgotten. Yes. But it marks an essential, essential piece of our commitment to show our memory to remembering together. So I want to thank each and every one of you for, for being here and to thank you again, Joan. Thank you, Rav Stephen, for taking a chance four years ago, four Kristallnachts ago, when the strange person came into the shul and said, can I tell my family story in your shul? You had no idea who you were letting in and uh, what that person would say. And you took a chance on me and I found a true spiritual home because you took a chance on me. So thank you so very, very much for doing that. You changed my life. Thank you, Joan. Thank you for always giving back and paying forward and remembering forward. Thanks to everybody and Lila Tov. Thank you everybody for showing up.